Okay, so I hope you all hear me. I, um, my name is Per Arvidsson. Uh, I'm one of the platform directors for the Drug Discovery and Development Platform. And um, we are very happy to host today one of our Drug Discovery Seminar Series. And we hope we will come back more for this during the, the spring semester. Uh, so today we were having uh, an interest in a topic um, which has um, uh, been of interest to many of our, of our antibody projects at the platform. And that's related to patenting of uh, therapeutic antibodies and, and how that is, is best done. And we noticed that uh, it seems to be a change in, in, uh, in the practice. Um, when it comes to what's possible to get the patent on when it comes to uh, biological um, uh, therapeutics. So um, um, today we will have uh, this session as um, uh, is less interactive than a regular Zoom. So I encourage you to, to use the chat function. And um, if you want to ask questions, then I will try to moderate and ask, read them up at the end. And, uh, our speaker today, Jens Victor Nørregård from uh, 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 from the Hybe uh, Patent uh, Company will hopefully be able to answer. So, uh, yeah, I think before we we can just leave the floor now to to Jens Victor, who is uh, uh, an expert on when it comes to patenting, and I think you can introduce yourself and take over the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Per, for this kind of introduction. I'm just checking that everything is working here. You can see my slides, and I can scroll up and down. Thank yes. you very much uh, for the introduction. <laughs> and I will try to give you an overview today of, of the state of the status of, of patenting a therapeutic antibodies and an update on, on recent practice. And it's it's not so much a change of, of practice as what you would call <laughs> in, in my world, a natural evolution of, of the practice that has, uh, the patent practice have evolved uh, side by side with the evolution, the scientific evolutions in, in the antibody uh, science. <clears throat> uh, this is the agenda. I'll look a bit at the background and try to make you understand why things are different from what they used to be. I will look at the normal patentability criteria and see how these uh, apply to uh, patenting of therapeutic antibodies and uses of therapeutic antibodies. I will look at the types of claims that you can get depending on what your uh, findings are. I also have a handful of examples from the real world, what types of claims you can get. A bit of look into strategy and just a few words about freedom to operate for uh, therapeutic antibodies. <clears throat> few words about myself. I'm Jens Victor Nogo. I'm a European patent attorney and a partner at the patent law firm Heuberg, located in uh, Copenhagen with offices also in Aarhus, Lund, and, and Stockholm. And uh, in times where there's no pandemia, I'm actually sharing my time between Copenhagen and, and Stockholm. So if you're located in Stockholm, there's a chance to meet me at the, a working lab at the Karolinska campus. <clears throat> I uh, have been working with patents since before the turn of the millennium, and I'm heading today uh, Heubeck's biotech, pharma, and chemistry practice team with 25 patent attorneys. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to, to ask them. They're, it's very inspiring if we can get questions and try to make this more interactive than, than it would normally be for uh, an internet presentations. Uh, I also included here a front page of a, an article that we have on our website where you can find information about therapeutic antibody patenting, written by one of my colleagues, Jenny Wandel-Peterson. <clears throat> now, going back in time, uh, how did the, uh, this, and this is an oversimplified, <laughs> of course, uh, illustration of the evolution that uh, the enormous evolution there has been within the antibody science, but going back some decades, uh, the immunoglobulins that were developed into products were isolated from serum and to a certain extent characterized. The real start of looking at monoclonal antibodies was back in the 70s when Milsan and Köhler 
who later got the Nobel Prize for their findings, uh, developed the hyperdoma technique where you could get single cells expressing recombinant monoclonal antibodies, or not recombinant, but expressing monoclonal antibodies that you could isolate and characterize. And then over the years, the techniques have been refined. So today you can generate monoclonal antibodies using a variety of techniques like phage display, single cell, B cell culture, humanized mice and humanized chicken. And uh, I guess I assume there are other species that have been humanized so that they are able to produce human monoclonal antibodies that can be isolated, cloned and characterized relatively quickly. And many companies today have a situation where they they just use a CRO for generating their antibodies. So you basically send your target to a CRO, they do the screening and come back with a handful of clones, and then you can select the one who's best. This is part of the reason why the patent officers also have taken the position that generating an antibody is routine. You just ask somebody to do it and you get your antibody. The same has happened within antibody humanization, which has also been the subject of a lot of patents uh, with the initial start where you had chimeric antibodies, just a fabric infused to a constant human region. Uh, so you had a combination of human and, and mice sequences in the antibodies. And later CDR grafting techniques were developed up to now where you have what you call <laughs> quotation marks, fully human antibodies generated in transgenic mice, chicken, other species. And also today, you can just send your Murian antibody to a CRO, and they will come up with some suggestions for humanized versions of your antibody. Much of this work is based on bioinformatics, where your CRs are grafted into the uh, human uh, immunoglobulin sequences that seem to be most similar to the mouse background from which they come. Uh, so, so that's sort of equivalent to humanizemyantibody.com and dialanantibody.com that I that I mentioned on the other slide. Also, this process is today considered by many patent offices as being routine. So, having humanized an antibody is not per se an invention unless there's something more in it. So, this doesn't mean that you cannot get claims on a new monoclonal antibody, and in particular, it doesn't mean you can't get claims on use of these monoclonal antibodies for treatment of diseases. Monoclonal antibodies and uses are about subject to patentability requirements, just like any other invention in any kind of field. So the sequence or the use must be novel. It must be inventive or what the Americans call monopious. And the invention must be enabled or sufficiently disclosed so that you have provided a description of how to make and use the invention. The principle behind patents being that you get a monopoly time limited monopoly for 20 years in exchange for a description of the invention. <clears throat> Taking, uh, looking through these uh, different requirements uh, one by one, novelty of a monoclonal antibody, and we can look at the different uh, invention categories here, is defined primarily today by its sequence. And getting, so there's a special thing about monoclonal antibodies is that there's such a huge variability in, in the CDRs that you can generate millions and millions of different antibodies that will be unique. And it's difficult a priori to predict the binding of these, the binding target or its binding affinity. So, so therefore you, can, you cannot really predict the sequence, but making the sequence is relatively routine. Other features that can be used to create novelty for an antibody related invention could be in its binding property. The antigen, sorry, it binds or the particular epitope that's bound by the antibody, the affinity it has, other kinetic parameters such as K on and K off or whatnot. Functional properties of antibodies could also define a novel feature of an antibody. So the way it acts on its targets, does it agonize or antagonize a receptor, whatever target it binds? Does it block signaling through that receptor? What is the result of, brain, of, of binding to the target? Is the cell killed? Does it enter into apoptosis? What happens to the receptor? Is the receptor internalization? 
or any downstream effects that may occur, for instance, in signaling pathways that are affected by binding of this antibody. So there are a number of different features that can be used to establish novelty of a monoclonal antibody. <clears throat> if you have groups of related monoclonal antibodies, for instance, if you're going through, uh, if you have immunized uh, an animal, you will typically get a, a series of different monoclonal antibodies that are related because they are generated from the same genes. And there will be some common structure in the CDR regions, <coughs> the CDRs. So from these, you may be able to define a structural motif, which could allow you to claim a genus, a group of antibodies, where you have amino acid substitutions in the CDRs. Uh, the same could be achieved if you have generated data on a range of different antibodies and you have gone through CDR mutations that do not affect its, the target to which it binds, but maybe affects the affinity. There you could also generate a group of different antibodies that are very different yet related. So that you can claim that they are a group of antibodies and they are all novel over the prior art. Finally, you can also get novelty for your antibodies if you have shown a new uh, a function. I didn't add here that the uh, antibodies, of course, can be used to treat diseases, but if you find a new disease that can be treated by a known antibody, that can also create novelty for antibodies or for groups of antibodies. And we will see some uh, examples of how that can be used to get patents, in particular from the European Patent Office. <clears throat> so how do you prove that your invention is novel? Well, if you have a sequence of a monoclonal antibody, <clears throat> it is up to the Patent Office to prove that your uh, patent, that your, sorry, your monoclonal antibody is not novel. They can do a sequence search, and if they don't find anything in the databases, it will be assumed that your antibody is novel. In the days of hyperdoma, it was very, very difficult to prove whether an antibody was novel. In fact, because you didn't have the sequence information. The same holds true if you claim antibodies partially through their function. In that case, the applicant has a burden of evidence of proving that the prior art antibodies, those that were known before your filing date, do not have those properties like binding affinity, uh, or effective functions or uh, downstream functions in the target that they bind to. <clears throat> and that can be very difficult to prove because in many cases, there are commercially available antibodies that can bind the same target. When it comes to inventive step, this is where you get your real challenge. I, I will start at the bottom of this slide uh, because that's a basic opinion by most patent offices across the world, except for the United States Patent Office. The, the basic assumption is that all new antibodies are obvious. And I have added a parenthesis, unless they are not, because there are actually antibodies that are not obvious. The position of the European Patent Office is very clear. It's routine to generate a new antibody. Once you have the target, you just generate antibodies, and that is straightforward. Uh, if you want to go from a mouse antibody or another non-human antibody into a human antibody, that is also straightforward because that there are many methods of doing that and they are relatively predictable. What you don't know when you start generating an antibody or when you start generating a humanized antibody is what will the end result be? What will the sequence be? So in the United States, which is different from all other patent offices across the world, the inventive step or the non-obviousness is also defined by its sequence. The basic position in the United States is still, as of today, it may well change in the future. Basic position is that any sequence that is novel is also non-obvious because you cannot predict a sequence. That is a position of the United States Patent Office. I think it's likely that this position will be changed at some point in future, in particular for antibodies, because it is really routine to generate a new antibody in particular when you use uh, contract research organizations to do it. <clears throat> but we have yet to see a case where this has been decided by, a, by the courts. So in the United States, the Pratt and Practice is decided uh, in, in majority by decisions from the, uh, the courts that, uh, that hear patent cases. In other 
patent offices, it is the properties or the uses of an antibody that gives the inventive step. And, and what properties are these then? You have to show, uh, in order to, to have an inventive step, you have to show that your antibody has some kind of unexpected technical effect. And what is unexpected and what is not unexpected depends a lot of what is known in, in advance for antibodies binding to your particular targets. It could be uh, kinetic parameters, as I mentioned before, the affinity or on-off rates of what other kind of kinetic parameters you could imagine. It could be a therapeutic activity in an animal model or even in a cellular assay. It could also be synergistic effects that you see in combination with other drugs or other treatments. Cross-species reactivity could also be uh, an unexpected technical effect, <coughs> depending on the circumstances. But the inventive properties may also lie in, in just in protein stability, reduced aggregation of your formulations. So, so long-term stability of your uh, antibody formulations, uh, because it could be challenging to produce a, an antibody that binds with high affinity and high specificity and has the right effects, and that is also stable. <clears throat> in some cases, the discovery process in itself could also contribute to the, the inventive step. If it is not just routine that you just sent your target to a CRO and they come back with antibodies, but if you have to make a series of decisions on the way, and then you have a very sophisticated screening process, that is also something that could add to the unexpected technical effect or to the inventive step. Also in case of, uh, of, of particular isotypes that are required to achieve a therapeutic activity or a given effect in your biological system, uh, the glycosylation or the effective functions that, that are ex, that are exerted by your antibody in, in function. So this is an, a non-exhaustive list, just examples of what kind of properties that could be used to prove that you have an inventive antibody and not just a new antibody. As for enablement, all that is really required for a claim to a monoclonal antibody, that is one monoclonal antibody defined by a sequence, is the sequence in itself, that it has some binding and it has a function. <clears throat> and that's all that's required for enablement or sufficiency, as it is called also. But for functional defined claims, you need to describe how to generate antibodies. Of course, you've generated maybe a group of antibodies that has these properties, but you have to make it possible for others based on your findings to screen and generate new antibodies that have the same properties. If you can't do that, if your antibodies are just sort of a lucky punch, then you're not entitled to a broad functionally defined claim. And one part of getting, approving this is that you have an assay for testing for the function that you are claiming for your antibody. And then finally, you also need to have a nexus between that function, whatever it is, and the utilities so or the use of the antibody in a therapeutic indication, for example. Why is it that binding this particular epitope has a beneficial effect in treatment of this disease? Or why is it that this K on rate or K off rate is so important that, that you have a new finding that is worthy of a patent application or, or a patent. So this is the kind of data that you need to have in your patent application. <clears throat> the data you need to have in there, and this is both for enablement or for proving inventive step, is of course a sequence. Uh, you should, for monoclonal antibodies, you should also include the CDRs, and there are a number of different ways of defining these. Um, you just need to define which system that you're using, and if you use different systems, please add them all, it's not a problem. You need some binding data. You need evidence of this unexpected technical effect. If you have functional features in your claims, you need to have an assay for uh, measuring that functional effect of your antibody. Finally, and that is a particular challenge in Europe, you need to have comparative data. It's not always necessary to have that in the patent application. But if you have that available when you file, it, it is an advantage because you need to show that this unexpected technical effect resides in your antibody and not in the antibodies that were known before your filing. 
And if you don't have the comparative data in your patent application, you may have to generate that data later on. If you don't have the data, but have an idea about, have the assumption, and I would assume that you always have that assumption that your antibodies are something special, you need to put that information in the application as well. And when you file your patent application, <coughs> excuse me. So a patent application is, excuse me, is, is actually sort of a sales document. You're selling your invention first to the, the examiner. Uh, in the second round, you, you're selling your invention to a partner or a collaborator or an investor. And in, in the ultimate case, you're actually selling your invention to the judge who's going to enforce your patent. So, so there, there's some amount of storytelling in your patent application, and you need to tell the story about why this, uh, why you went through the steps that you went through. What is the rational between your findings? What was the discovery process in the case of monoclonal antibodies? Why did you make the choices that you made on the way of getting to the goal? What were the challenges that you uh, ran into what is so special about your antibody and what sets it aside from other antibodies and in this case it can be depending on the case it can be an advantage to have sort of negative data in your patent application on those antibodies that do not meet your requirements those antibodies that fail that were didn't have the property if you can if you can use that data to to tell your story and to support why a particular finding uh, was important and how the choices that you made in the discovery process led you to there and not to, to antibodies that have don't have that function, that can be an advantage. And if your invention is in the field of humanization of antibodies, you have to describe the humanization processes and any challenges in getting there. And uh, trust me, if, if there were no challenges, you're not going to get your patent on your humanized antibody. And what kind of back mutations did you do when you have made your first uh, humanization, maybe based on, on bioinformatics? Um, and what kind of negative data did you have? Because maybe some of the uh, predictions that were made uh, in, in the bioinformatics steps of your humanization led to antibodies that lost its binding affinity or lost its binding altogether. <clears throat> that negative data can actually help you in securing your, uh, your patent on a humanized antibody. And then again, for a patent application in the United States, you don't need all of this. If your sequence is new, you're going to get your patent in the United States as of today. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, looking at what you can patent, this is an, sort of an overview that, that applies to all different kinds of uh, technology. Centrally, you have the product, which is can be the subject of a, a new patent application. Surrounding the product, you can have compositions comprising that product. You can have uh, upstream methods of getting to the product, either by manufacturing or method of identifying your product, steps in manufacturing, intermediate products, and further steps in manufacturing your product. And then you can have downstream uses of your product patented as well. So for each of these types uh, steps or in, in, in a process and it's generating in a, in a process of generating a product, the product formulation of the product and use of the product, you can have a patent application if you have data. And if we apply this to, uh, to antibodies, we have as a product in the center, we have the antibody X for lack of a better word, you can have formulations of your antibody. These formulations could be co-formulations with other active ingredients or just formulations that would need to lead to some kind of, of technical effect. Uh, upstream, you can have steps of manufacturing, your cell lines, your hyperdoma, uh, and, and downstream processing. Uh, once you have expressed your antibody, how is it purified in order to get to the final pure product? Um, the same here, method of preparing the antibody, method of identifying, that can also be subject of a patent, but commercially, it doesn't really give that protection you, you get from the, the other types of, of patents. 
And then of course you can have patents on using of antibodies, for, for example, use of antibodies for treating cancer or other diseases, or use of antibodies in combination with different drugs, because antibodies are very often used in, in combination treatments with other drugs. <clears throat> so I mentioned uh, previously that, that getting a patent on a monoclonal antibody or a humanized antibody in the United States is easy, though I should never say that anything is easy in this world. That is easy, but getting the broad claims in the United States is extremely difficult. So they have two requirements in their patent law concerning enablement, where in Europe, we only have the requirement of enablement. So how to make and use the invention. In the United States, they also have what is called the written description requirement. And the written description requirement as it applies to antibodies means that a written description of a group of antibodies means description of the sequences. And you have a group of antibodies defined by binding to an epitope or having a particular function. It is impossible to describe the sequences before you have made them because there is limited structure function relationship when it comes to antibodies in, in the CDRs. We are not there yet where we can have a computer generate the CDRs and come up with a suggestion for an antibody that has a particular binding ability. This means that many patents in the United States that try to claim antibodies broader than just a specific sequence will fail for this reason, the written description requirement, which is why it is very, very difficult to get anything that has a broad scope in the United States. <clears throat> so I summarize a few of the US peculiarities is that, that, that any novel sequence is considered non-obvious. So if you have a new sequence, whether it's a new monoclonal antibody or a humanized version of a mouse or chicken antibody or whatever it is, that's considered non-obvious. And if you have binding data, show it has a function, you have your patent. And as I said, it's close to impossible to provide a written description of a group of antibodies defined, for instance, by binding to a particular epitope. Therefore, you will have a hard time getting product patents like that. The European Patent Office on the other side, on the other hand, is very tough and inventive step. They consider, or it considers, any new antibody as being obvious unless it has an unexpected technical effect. And that can be difficult to prove, in particular, if you need to compare to, to known antibodies. <clears throat> on the other hand, on the plus side, is it's actually possible to get a claim to antibodies or a product claim defined by function of an antibody like the binding epitope or kinetics, and I'll come with a few examples of this later on. It's also possible to get relatively broad claims for medical use. And in the medical field, getting a broad claim is commercially extremely valuable because as you know, any medical product that is sold has a label on it. Uh, so, so there is no way of avoiding uh, the use that is in a, a medical use claim. I have here some generic suggestions for claims that, that are possible to get for, for antibodies, for recombinant antibodies and for uses of antibodies. So an antibody could be defined by having particular combinations of CDRs for the heavy and for the light chain. Another way to define an antibody, it could be through the VH and the VL sequences used to generate the antibody in the case where you have two chains for the antibody. <coughs> And in some cases, it's even possible to get some, some amount of sequence variation around a VH and VL sequence. It's difficult to get any kind of variation around CDRs unless you have examples of different antibodies that are close related in terms of their CDRs and have the same function. You can also get antibodies capable of binding to a particular epitope, at least in Europe. You could also have antibodies claims, product claims to antibodies capable of, for example, for example, binding to a target with an affinity above or a K off below or, or other kind of kinetic parameters or, or other kinds of functions. So a combination of a structural limitation, so an antibody that is a structural limitation, and then a functional limitation. And on the use side, you can get claims to use of an antibody against the target 
for treatment of a particular disease, if there's, if you've shown a for the first time that this target is involved in this disease and that by binding an antibody to the target, you can treat the disease, that can entitle you to a claim, broad claim to any antibody against this target for treatment of this type of disease. <clears throat> Very often though, you have to put some properties on, on, the, on the antibodies. So it's not just an antibody binding a particular target, but also an antibody having a particular property for treatment of a disease. Further, you could also be an antibody <clears throat> in combination with another drug to treat a disease or in combination with other types of treatment like a radiation therapy or surgery or, or whatnot. So these are sort of an overview of the, of the different types of antibodies. And, and in going through an antibody product, you might, may not find all of these applications uh, right up front. And I'll get a bit back to that later. So in the next slides, I have some uh, examples of real world patents that have been granted on antibodies. <clears throat> some of these are new and some of these are, are older age. So this is an example of a European patent uh, on an invention that was filed in 2003, that's some years back, I, I give that to Ono Pharmaceuticals. It's a use of an anti-PD-1 antibody, which inhibits the immunosuppressive signal of PD-1 for the manufacture of medicament for treatment of cancer. So that's a very broad claim. It will in effect protect use of any kind of anti-PD-1 antibody for treatment of cancer. I have here an example of uh, an epitope claim. So that is a patent granted to any antibody that binds an epitope. In this case, we have uh, an antibody, a fragment that recognizes an epitope of a HER2 receptor truncated from, and I guess that I assume that sequence number one is the full length of the uh, HER2 receptor. That epitope is defined by a sequence. And here we have another sequence that defines the epitope. And there's a functional limitation. The antibody is suitable to distinguish the protein of sequence number one from the HER2 receptor. So you have the HER2 receptor, or you have a truncated version, and this antibody can distinguish between the, the full length and the truncated version. This is a product claim based on a patent application that was filed in 2008 to a uh, Spanish university hospital. Here we have an example of a European patent granted to Genentech on an application filed in 2007. It's also an epitope claim. So we have an anti-IgE M1 antibody that specifically binds an epitope in the M1 sequence of IgG, uh, IgE defined by residues 317 to 351. So it's a relatively long epitope. And then there's a functional uh, limitation on the claim as well. This antibody must be capable of inducing apoptosis in IgE expressing B cells. Pretty broad claim. Uh, from a filing at around the same time from Insom in France, we have a patent that has been granted, <coughs> excuse me, uh, on a pharmaceutical composition comprising an anti CD39 ad antibody which inhibits the activity of regular T cells, T Rex, for use in the treatment and prevention of cancers. So it's a, a use claim. It has a combination of a structural limitation where it's an antibody, it binds to CD39, and it also has a property that it can inhibit the activity of T regulatory cells because they express CD39. And then it's for use in treatment and prevention of cancer. And just to illustrate the difference between the kind of claims you can get in the European Patent Office and the US Patent Office, uh, I have inserted claim one from a US patent that has been granted uh, based on the same original application. And this is just an anti c 39 antibody. This is a product claim uh, comprising the heavy chain CDRs and the light chain CDRs of an antibody obtainable from a hybridoma deposited as, and then there's an accession number two, a, uh, a bank, a cell bank where the hyperdoma has been deposited. So this is a very, very narrow claim on the antibody, whereas the European claim just dominates the whole field of anti CD39 antibodies for treatment of cancers. 
this doesn't mean that they have exhausted their possibilities of getting patents in the United States. You can go and continue filing continuation application and continuation application, and maybe they will be able to get something broader than this, but this is what they have as of today or yesterday. I have another example from a Swedish company, Cantagia, uh, on anti-IL-1 RAB antibodies, <coughs> uh, based on application filed in 2011. Uh, the wording is a bit different, but in central it's the same. Uh, an agent comprising or consisting of an antibody or an antigen binding fragment thereof. The antibody is specific for IL-1 RAP, and it's for use in treating and preventing cancer in a patient when the cancer is a solid tumor, having cells would express IL-1 RAP. That's also a very broad claim, no structural limitation on the antibody, but they were the first to show that you that there was IL-1 RAP expression in solid tumors and that therefore you could use an antibody to treat cancers that expressed IL-1 RAP. And finally, I think this is the last of these specific examples. We have an example from, uh, from Sanofi, a uh, European patent based on a patent application filed in 2013. And I only inserted uh, part of the claim because it's very long. It starts with A and B, and then it ends with P and Q an isolated monoclonal antibody that binds specifically to a particular target, plasminogen activator inhibitor type one, and then it comprises a heavy chain framework region and the RIBA region, and then it defines the CDRs from the heavy chain and from the light chain, and it has an OR, and then it goes on OR, 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 and it ends with P and Q. So this goes for about one and a half page of description. So they must have had a series of different, I assume, related, structure related antibodies that bind the same target. And they've been able to get a pattern on each and every of these antibodies. So um, that was uh, all about the specific examples uh, of claims that I have looked at. And I will now look a bit into to strategy and then uh, end up with talking a bit about freedom to, to operate. Uh, so when you're in the world of patents, we always have timelines. Uh, we have, when we file a patent application, we have the priority year during which a patent application can be updated with new information, new data. After the first 12 months, uh, usually a PCT application is filed. This is filed as one application. It's examined uh, by, well, for European applicants, very often by the European Patent Office. And then after those two and a half years from the first filing, you went to national phase. So this is just the, the basic timeline and patents. Uh, but when you're in the patent world, you need to think ahead. You need to think many years ahead, actually not just 20 years ahead because although the patent term is 20 years, you have the priority year and that's another one year. So that's 21 years. And then for uh, drugs, for medical products, you can get patent term extensions. In Europe, it's called a supplementary protection certificate. In the United States, it's called patent term extension, and you can get up to five years of additional patent term for a product that is subject to regulatory approval, which means that for one patent application, it can be kept in force for 26 years and cover your product. And in fact, you may have to think more than 26 years ahead because you don't just file your one patent application on the first product if it's a product, it could also be a use pattern that you start up with, but this is not a, an untypical uh, um, illustration where you start with your basic pattern on the product. <clears throat> it may get an extension of five years. You don't get that for all of these, just for one of them. And then you have a follow-on pattern on the use, and then you have another follow-on pattern on doses regimen, inventions that are conceived and filed during the clinical development. So. In effect, you have to think very far ahead, not just for this patent application, but also for the future patent applications you're going to file uh, in the coming years to protect your product as it is developed further and further and as it reaches the market. This also means that when you file your first patent application, of course, you need to put the information in there that is required. But if you put too much sort of broilerplate text in there, you may actually harm the possibility of getting future patents. Because here are some examples of, of future claims that you might want to file in the coming years, maybe in one, in two, or five, or 10 years from now, considering the long development timelines that, that 
apply for uh, for antibody drugs. It could be claims on expression, purification, formulation of your antibodies. Those is regiment. This is something you wouldn't know up front. When you go to clinical development, you might be looking into biomarkers that are associated with your disease or can help in selecting those patients that would be responders as opposed to non-responders. And whereas you might have an idea on broadly on, on the disease that you're treating up front, uh, primary and secondary endpoints that you're looking at in clinical development, but certainly not something that you have already uh, in, when you file the first application. But if you speculate too much about each and everything that could happen in future, you are harming the possibility of getting these uh, future patents. And then of course, when you develop a therapeutic antibody, you don't just get your patent exclusivity, you also get a regulatory exclusivity from the EMA or from the FDA in the United States. You can have, you have data exclusivity or orphan drug status. You can get pediatric extensions if that's relevant for your indication. In the United States for a, an antibody, you get a biologics license application. And the data exclusivity provided by EMA gives you 10 years of exclusivity on the market. Uh, and the biologics license application in the United States will give you 12 years of exclusivity. Uh, on the market. And this is when you start looking at the combination of different exclusivities that you get on your product and you can look into timing of filing your future applications. Then you're looking into two different timelines uh, like we have here uh, on this slide, uh, where we just for illustration, we have illustrated a product that is projected to enter the market in 2027. You get your data protection from the EU, maybe orphan drug status as well. Uh, this is just the five years you get for a normal chemical. In the United States, you'll get 12 years for your antibody, so data exclusivity, and the orphan drug designation in the United States will then only be the seven years. Then you might have different patents that also protect your product. You have maybe a product patent and a use patent, and you can extend the duration of these uh, by, by getting supplementary protection certificates in Europe or patent term extension in the United States. So this was uh, a bit about strategy and thinking forward and leaving room for new inventions uh, to come in future. Uh, finally, I will look a bit into to freedom to operate, which is also relevant for, uh, for antibodies and uses of antibodies. Uh, first, uh, just a brief look at freedom to operate. What is freedom to operate? It's a possibility. It's a, so, so you can get a patent on your product, but that means that others could also get a patent on, on similar products. And you've seen examples of uh, the patents that you can get from the European Patent Office, for example, that would cover a broad field. For instance, the anti-CD39 antibodies for treatment of cancer, that's a pretty broad claim, which would dominate any anti-CD39 antibody used for treatment of cancer. So, before you can enter the market, you need to do a clearance search to look into dominating patent rights that could prevent you from being able to commercialize your product at the time of getting to the market. So the activities that you have during discovery and development are not considered patent infringement. It's only when you get a patent, an approval from the regulatory authorities and start selling your product that it's considered patent infringement. So you need to keep that timing into mind when you look at freedom to operate. And since timelines are very long, it, there's a likelihood that patents that you see now have expired before you actually get on the market. So we have looked at, at patentability. And when you look at patentability, what you're looking at, you focus on the invention and you get at the features that you have in your invention, the sequence of function and everything. You have just the one novel feature in, in your claim, then everything can be claimed that would fall under that umbrella. And when you look at novelty and inventive step, the priority includes, includes everything that's published anywhere in the world, <clears throat> global criteria. Uh, and patentability is relevant only for those that file patent applications. Whereas freedom to operate, the likelihood that you can be sued once you get on the market, that is relevant for all companies, whether they have patents or not, they have to care about freedom to operate. And in freedom to operate, you need to check your product, your patents don't matter at all when you're looking at your freedom to operate. What matters here is the patents that belong to others. 
you need to look at all steps, all components and all ingredients that are used in making your product, that are included in your product and the uses of your product. And when you look into freedom to operate, you don't look into articles or scientific publications, only patents matter. Patents matter. And patents are national rights. So you need to distinguish between patent rights in the United States and Europe and Japan and China or where you're going on the market. So the fact that there's a US patent can never prevent you from entering the market in Europe. That's just to set the landscape, the difference between freedom to operate and patentability. And how would you look into freedom to operate when you are generating antibodies? This can be very extensive when you're looking into a freedom to operate for each and every step in manufacturing for your product and for uses thereof. Uh, but you don't need to do everything from the beginning. What you would do initially before you start screening for a, uh, a new uh, project, you will look into any patents that would prevent you at all from doing anything. So you'll be looking at blocking patents and you could look at patent, what we call this a patent landscaping, where you look at what kind of patents are out there. Is there any, are there any blue oceans or maybe just blue lakes or blue ponds where, where there's little activity. So there's room for your patents and also freedom to operate. And when you have a target, uh, I would include apart from the biology and, and the medical uses, I would also include the option of freedom to operate in, in selection of a target. Are there any blocking patents that would prevent you from commercializing an antibody against a particular target? And when you go through antibody discovery and get your sequences, I would do FTO screens for the sequence, looking for keyword searches to, to, to identify those broader use claims that you could have. And when you go through lead selection, uh, the, the risk becomes larger. You have to be more certain that there is freedom to operate and you will look into more detail on, uh, on freedom to operate for your lead sequence by having sequence searches and also keyword searches here. And when you need to decide on what kind of antibody isotype you're using, you also need to be to look into freedom to operate searches here and be very careful because there are lots and lots of patents on mutations in the constant regions of, of different kinds of antibody isotypes. <clears throat> and then as you go into preclinical development, you need to invest more and more into this uh, and, and also in manufacturing and formulation of your product in the end. And uh, before I just wrap up, uh, what is, uh, how can we help? We can, of course, help with each and every step of this, uh, this process. But the most important role of us is to, to, uh, to make sure that, that you feel like this sleeping baby, that you feel certain that everything is okay and you can relax and focus on your, on your science. Uh, and in order to get a nice package uh, for investors or for partners, uh, you need to, to to have all this mapped out, have a plan, have timelines showing what your patent, how long your patents uh, last, what is your plan for future patents? Uh, do you have a dominant position forcing competitors up, say, in a license, or do you have freedom to operate? And then you can package all this. Uh, and this is when you have a situation where you have something that Big Pharma is interested in. And I think uh, with that, uh, I have ended my slideshow and I'm very happy to. Uh, to take questions from here, if there are any. So thank you very much, Jens. It was a very, very good overview, I think, and very suitable for, for the, the audience. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there's dropping in now, I don't see here. People are raising their hands, but you need to type in your questions, or I will not be able to. I will not be able to see. I will can, I can allow them to talk if you want to, Pan. I can give them permission okay. to. Okay, then uh, you can, uh, Anders Olsson, have a question. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hmm? Okay, first of all, thanks for a really clear and, and uh, comprehensive talk. I, I actually have two questions. Uh, the, the one is, we're talking about antibodies here, but let's say you're, you have your target, you get an antibody, 
Is there any way you could sort of cover the possibility that you can address the same target with a small molecule? And that's going to be very, very challenging. Uh, in, in some cases, uh, you, you, can, you can, if you really have some new finding, for instance, the first time you have shown that there is an interaction, for instance, between two, two targets uh, in, in a human cell or an animal cell, and you've shown by blocking this interaction, you can achieve a, a therapeutic effect. You could say that you should be entitled to anything that would block this interaction. And, and sometimes in the United States, you can get away with uh, drafting clever claims like uh, uh, a method of providing or preventing interaction between target X and target Y, comprising in here, administer, administering an inhibitor of that binding. But you, the challenge will be to describe the molecules you're using for it. Yeah, but you, but if you know exactly the mechanism, what specific interactions you're inhibiting, and you say you could do this with an antibody, but you could also do it with a small molecule. Yeah, I mean, you, I, I would certainly make the try, <laughs> 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 and, and, may, and maybe I would start questioning the inventors. So, so could you maybe design based on your knowledge? Do you think you could design at least on uh, on paper <laughs> some peptides that could be used for this interaction? If you have two targets in action, yeah. uh, you know the sequence. If you know the interaction residues, maybe you could at least design hypothetically um, the structure of a, a a small molecule peptide inhibitor. Uh, and maybe if you have the uh, the X-ray, the, the crystal, uh, and you have the coordinates, you could argue that you could use uh, uh, computers to generate uh, small molecules that could inhibit. I mean, you could make the try. Yeah, I'm Thanks. not sure you could use it for in, for stopping a competitor on the market, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but at but least you can uh, you you can use it for attracting the interest uh, of, of partners. Right. And, and the other question is, how big a part will the same manufacturing patents play in the in the terms of, of, of antibodies? Um, no, I don't think it plays a huge role today because that's pretty much standardized because of the common structure of antibodies. Uh, so I'm not sure that this is a big deal. Okay, so mm. it would not be a major concern, you would say? No, I think, I mean, from a freedom to operate perspective, I think it's possible to find ways of manufacturing any kind of antibody that will not infringe on other patents. And typically you would engage a, a contract manufacturing organization to do that. And they have their, each have their technology. And, and I would assume that they have done their freedom to operate work. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Uh, then uh, we have two more questions so far. You can either raise your hand or um, type in, but uh, in the order here, to us is the next one. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Mm. Okay, hello, my name is Toas Fjörts, I'm from Lund. Yes. Uh, I'm very naive in, in, in patenting, but uh, when I was happy to see that we got one patent granted, like you cited here, the I one wrap. <laughs> So, yes. mm. But that brings me to the mind, kind of, of the academic perspective in this, what I find difficult. And that is, as researchers, we are quite good at identifying targets. Mm. And we are quite good at finding mechanisms of actions, kind of. Yes. And like you say, more or less, you, to generate an antibody and finding a new sequence typically would work. You cannot do it, but, but I mean, that's possible. Mm -hmm. But what I think as a scientist, I often discover is that I look through the patenting and then for example, what have been granted. And I suddenly realized that someone has made a claim. <laughs> this target, this antibody, it's a different antibody, mm -hmm. but it's it against cancer, right? Mm -hmm, and then I go example. into the, mm -hmm. then go, I go into the patent, and it turns mm -hmm. out they have checked cell lines, or I mean, there, there's no inventive step whatsoever. Or maybe I'm using the wrong phrase here. Mm -hmm. It's not a relevant model system they have used. Mm -hmm. But what we are trained as scientists is really to to use the sharpest models, so we can show mm -hmm. it much more elegantly how this works with this use. But but then we stay away because it says. 
it's patented for cancer. So, so how, I mean, they have a granted patent in the US for this and how should we kind of find our way out of that jungle? Do you understand yeah, that, that? Yeah, I understand your question and I also understand that <laughs> what you're explaining about, you can find the interactions, but, but patenting at an early stage is difficult for your university research. You don't have the resources to go out and have somebody gener like Genentech uh, that can generate thousands of antibodies within a short period of time and, and then select yeah. the good ones. And the situation you're describing there is that uh, you also have to factor in the development timelines. So is it really a problem that there was a patent, maybe it was filed some years ago and you're looking into maybe at least 10, 15 years before you can get on the market? Mm. I think there's a likelihood that that patent will have expired. There's also the likelihood that the patent is invalid. Uh, because it wasn't, as you say, if the science wasn't good, it, it shouldn't be possible to enforce this, but you never know, of course. Mm. Uh, so uh, it's not an easy situation. As a researcher, you should not be prevented by patents. But of course, if you want to commercialize your findings, uh, you have to, to, to care about it. Yeah, because I, 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 yeah. very often you find patents that are actually done in a very strange model. Totally, mm. I mean, totally irrelevant model, but the claim they have gotten the patent and then we probably, one could challenge that patent, say that this, they have not proven what the examiner thought was yes. relevant. Yes, yes. And unfortunately, that might be, be very difficult. Uh, I mean, the, the examiner is, is not in a position as, as you are to, to, to determine up front that this no. is a bad model. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they, are, <laughs> they are not active scientists. They have the scientific background, but they are not in a position to, to question the scientific findings of a patent application. No. So that typically only comes up in opposition or uh, in, in litigation where yeah. you have another party which is just as competent as, as the applicant. Thank you. And then you will have a, a, yeah. a battle of the experts, which is something that the, the judges don't really like. <laughs> and the final question, you saw, you showed a very nice gift box at the end, right? <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. and we are academics, more, mm -hmm. I don't know in this audience, but at least I am. And, mm -hmm. and what happens in reality then, when, when you move this forward, is that you, at some stage, you get support from innovation offices, etc., but not mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder how much does this box cost? I, I know it's not, <laughs> I know it's not an easy, because it depends on targets, how much work. But I mean, yeah. what are we talking about, approximately? I, I don't think I can give a cost estimate because the box is, is not just the patents. Uh, it's also your science. It's primarily the science and and the. Uh, no, the, I'm the, not talking. No, I'm not talking about the science here. I'm talking about. You have your target, you have your antibody, mm -hmm. you think you have the mechanism, now you want to find out, should I be able to pers pursue this from a perspective of, of, of getting a patent, freedom to operate, etc. What does it co cost for a researcher approximately to, to get your help to get started, kind of, not the entire process. Do you understand my question? Is that... Well, to get started, so... <clears throat> So normally I mean, you would look into a patentability assessment uh, initially. Mm. Uh, I'm not freedom too fond to of giving freedom to operate. Well, maybe yes, uh, at least for the target. Uh, mm. yeah. But but that's uh, I would say freedom to operate is often it's not very broad. A, I understand. Yeah, it's, it's often not a problem because if there are broad patents, they would have some years and they will be some years old uh, and will maybe not present a problem when you get to to, to the market but uh, uh i would rather if you maybe contact me <laughs> yeah uh, offline afterwards yeah, and then the, <laughs> yeah then we can it's discuss amazing. it but i can assure you that uh, that the patent costs are, are minor compared to the costs involved in the science and the clinical yeah. development mm. yeah thank you thank you very much welcome Okay, uh, so we are running close to two o'clock, which I think we need to end. But I, we have one written question here, if we could take that one as well. And someone here is asking if um, you could elaborate a bit more on how groundbreaking the inventive step needs to be in Europe. Ooh, yeah, yeah. So so that's uh, it's quite uh, elastic. There's no black-white answer to that. Uh, 
I would think for a normal uh, drug discovery project that if you get, if, if you manage to find a, an antibody in this case that, that meets your requirement and that can actually be used for clinical testing, then I think with all likelihood you have something that is so good that you can patent it. Uh, if you're a scientist and if you look at some findings and say, wow, this is, this is good, then I'm sure you're there. It doesn't have to be a Nobel Prize finding. So somewhere in between, I don't know how much this helps. <laughs> but there okay. must be some, something that, it also depends on what, what was known in advance in this particular field, this narrow field of, of, of your, um, your antibody or your target. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we, we need to, to wrap this up. Uh, at least to me, it's been very good. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do like a, a virtual applause here, but uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very confident that most uh, would like to do it if it would have been possible. So thank, thank you, you very much, much Jens, uh, for, uh, for this brilliant talk. And thank you all for, for joining this drug discovery seminar series. Um, we'll get back with some other topic soon. Okay, I wish you all a happy weekend. Thank you very much.